Hi guys, it's uh, Thursday afternoon and it's just too hot to be outside. So it's YouTube time. Uh, this week I want to share a little bit. I just, I call it the power of origins. And there is a, um, there's some things to be seen and understood that I think will help us in our daily lives. Uh, there's different kinds of revelation. There's a kind of revelation that um, God gives us and can be totally transforming uh, the rest of our walk with him on earth uh, and it, they have that revelation has direct effect on the our walk and normally on relationships it changes the way we do relationships there's revelations that he gives that kind of like on the put them on the shelf revelations because it's really for another part of of your journey that might be um, in the near or distant future either way and um, there are things that he will give you a partial understanding of and then later on he fills in some of those gaps and you begin to see with a greater fullness how you really needed that particular thing how that thing was uh, important and key in your life and then there's revelations that um, I think all they do is just give you big heads they don't they don't really help us out anyway, and sometimes it's a easy trap for anybody who's in kind of any kind of ministry to fall into to try to seek out um, those, those kind of revelations that will thrill people or whatever. But unless they unless they have a practical application, they're really just it's it's just like blowing up balloons. It's really not going to do anything for you. So, but uh, what I want to, uh, to me, this a couple of things in what I'm going to share have been really revelations for me. That the one I'm going to touch today, I saw it, but I didn't get it. I didn't understand, um, and I know I don't know that I do now. Still, the the import of it, but it's been um, as the months have rolled by, it's been gaining force, and. I'm going to share some of that today. Um, we'll start off with the fact that there's, and I just, this is just my way of understanding it. I'm not saying it's the solid concrete truth, but it helps me understand it. I think there's two kinds of commandments that God gives. One is, um, I call them the systemic, systematic um, commands. And those are the kind of commands that God used when he was, creating the world and creating the, the, the system in which we live. We, it's called the cosmos in the Bible, but he, and all of the natural creation, everything about it. You know, when he says, let there be light, that was a command. And that command carried power. It's not like the kind of commands we give our children when we wanted them to, to do or not to do, stop hitting your sister. You know, it was, it's not that kind of a command. It's a command that carried power and nothing could resist it. There was no ability to resist it. When he said, let there be light, there was light because the command itself carried that creative power. And then there are commands that come within the system itself. And uh, when he says, thou shalt not covet, that is a command. Thou shalt not covet. I, um, I've heard people minister that that's just a future promise, and that could be, but in, in, nevertheless, in the context it came in, it was a commandment. But that command did not carry the power to not covet. It, um, it, it was, and that was one of the purposes of the laws that we could discover that. And that we would opt for something better that did carry power to complete it. So, um, there, we're going to look at some of these commandments where we need to keep in mind that there are some commandments that you, neither you nor I, can resist. It, they're not up for argument. They're not up for negotiation. They're just the way things are going to be because it's how he set it up. And so, um, we're going to talk about the, the beginning and the creation of Adam and Eve and and some things to be seen there. Um, so here's here's some uh, 
verses out of Genesis 124, then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind. That was a, a systemic command. That had to happen. It had power and it just happened. In Genesis 2, 7, And the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Um, and then there's a, this, I believe this is a parameter command. This is a, one of the system commands were in 128. It says, And God blessed them, talking about uh, man, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Now, I, I believe that that carried power. I believe that drives the human race. That command is still over the human race to be fruitful and multiply and replenish. We, and subdue, we, um, it's gotten, it's gotten twisted and turned and um, a little wrung inside out by the entrance of sin into lives and how that, how sin interacts with that commandment. And so instead, basically, instead of subduing all the elements of the earth and the animals and the fish and the birds and that, man's busy trying to subdue each other. And it just creates, it, history is the history of the problems that that has created. But uh, my point is, is that's a, I think that was a kind of command that was a, over the system. This is not, we can't say, oh, I opt out of that one. I, I, I don't want to be in the fruitful multiply subdue group. No, it's, it's just, it's a commandment that is on every human being. It's a drive. Okay, so let's talk, let's talk about Adam just a second. Um, and in this creation of Adam, in God creating Adam, there's some uh, some things that we some observations we can make. Um, the first one is this: we know that God was working from a model. Um, most ma many artists, most artists probably, when they're going to paint a picture, they're working from a photo. They're working from some kind of a scenery they've laid a hold of. They're using a model. Um, now, we know God was using a model when he created man. What was it? Himself. I don't know if he was sitting in front of a mirror or what, but he was using himself. He's making man after his image, after his likeness. Okay, that's going to be very important. Um, number two, we know this in the creation of Adam. God was not working alone uh, because he uses the plural. He uses second uh, first person plural. We let us let us make man. And now I'm just I I believe um, that us is who we now call the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and I'm just going to rattle off some verses from Proverbs eight, which is the chapter that gives us probably the most insight into pre earth activity that was going on. And, and so here's some verses out of Proverbs 8. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way. This is verse 22. Before his works of old, verse 24, when there was no depths, I was brought forth. That's an important word right there. I was brought forth. My, um, some theologians argue about this, but I think this is very obviously Jesus, the Son, speaking. He is God's co-creator in this. He says, so when there was no depths, I was brought forth. Uh, verse 26, while he had not yet made the earth and the fields, then I was beside him, verse 30, as a master workman. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Talk about a pardon. Verse 31, rejoicing in the world, his earth, and having my delight in the sons of men. I think at that point, it was the, the father's, uh, the, the, the delight he had in the sons of men were the vision and the dream inside of the father's heart of these sons of men, and it just thrilled the Lord Jesus. And so when it says, let us, I think that's who it's talking about, at least those two. And they were creating together. They were workers together. 
All right, so we know that um, God had a model himself. He was not working alone. He had the master workman next to him. And number three, we know that, uh, that at first, man had both male and female parts in him. He was one, but had both those parts in him. Genesis 2.21, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. That happens to me every afternoon. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. So a major surgery going on there. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of me. Um, I read somewhere that the, the, the language there really indicated womb man. And uh, anyway, so we know that uh, we, we see how uh, God separated those two parts that were originally together. Number four, we know that by this time, before this actually happens, Adam is already in management. Uh, he's very exposed to all the operations and the functioning of this creation. He's been on the scene, and he, Adam is an incredibly intelligent um, being. Much more to, to um, portray him as w one of us today. No, he he had a, an immense in, in intelligence and ability and understanding. Because and it was none corrupted. There were no shadows. There was no shadow of turning. It was all full light to him. And so he's already in management. He's very exposed to all the way that creation is functioning. He's learning. He's contributing. He's co-creating with the Father and the Son. He has PhDs in business and zoology. He's really uh, on, the, on the job here. But uh, in, in Quentin's imagination, he has some questions. Being a, a man of extreme intelligence and perception and very powerful he he's not just functioning as a as a, a dumb waiter a slave he he has some questions about this and of course the big question is by this time having a degree in zoology he notices that um, every male part has a female part he, every every bull has a cow. Every rooster has a hen. He's picking all this up. Uh, every sow has a boar, and he's he sees that this is how that that um, that commandment that's over him to be fruitful and multiply. This is how that happens. But the the stumper is he looks all around and. Um, finds no compatible um, counterpart that would belong to him, that would be his. So, you know, this is one of the first place, uh, places where kind of there's this, this thing called divine tension, and it's, it's operating. He's finding himself strung between two poles. One is this, the power of this um, system command to be fruitful and multiply and to increase and, and subdue. And, and yet, seemingly, there is no way to do so. The way to do so has not been provided. And that creates some tension. And, and we've all visited that place of, of tension. It's one of God's favorite places. Just ask Abraham as, as the Lord tells him, now take your only son, Isaac, and offer him oh, tension right away. What? How could that be? Because this is totally contradicting this, and here I am in the middle of this contradiction, and God just smiles and nods his head. Um, take my yoke upon me, uh, upon you, and rest. Huh? Yoke is not, you do not associate yoke with rest. Quite the opposite. You associate yoke with work, and yet this is the command of God. Um, Give thanks in tribulation. <clears throat> well, yeah, we all, every one of you know, the last thing you feel like doing in the midst of that is not giving thanks, maybe a little complaining. 
Um, and yet, here's this command. And there's this tension, you know, and, and Jesus was no stranger to it, but a physician, heal thyself. Come down off that cross if you're this and that. I mean, there it is. So uh, he, 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 the, he finds, Adam finds himself in this place of, of tension. And um, there doesn't seem to be, as the days or whatever the time measurement they had, if rolled by, there does not seem to be a forthcoming answer to that tension. And then there's another question that this Adam man has. And it's, where did the master workman come from? He looks at his uh, co-laborers there, his, the, the people he has, the, the beings he has fellowship with is the father and the master workman. And he's looking at the master workman and he thinks, dang it, he's the spitting image. Looks just like him, acts like him, talks like him. And they're, they're so close, they're so close. I, I, I'm just, they obviously sense this belonging to each other and belonging is something that I don't have. Loneliness is uh, the, the, the deepest knife in the gut that mankind can experience. And he's looking at the father and the master workman and he's wondering, why don't I belong? They belong to each other, look at this. And we read in Proverbs that it was a party. Their togetherness was a party. This, the workman, the son is just rejoicing in everything the father's doing. They're laughing, they're carrying on. They're obviously enjoying themselves way beyond Adam's ability to understand. And, and Adam, Adam can perceive it all has to do with belonging. And there it is again, he doesn't belong. And he, there's nobody who belongs to him. And he has to look at the, um, having a, this degree in zoology, he's looking at the father and looking at the son and thinking, where's she? Where's the cow? Where's the hen for this? Where did that, where did that son come from? How did that happen? It just doesn't make sense. Anything I can see doesn't make sense that this. And so um, he's, he's got these, uh, he has at least these two questions. And, there, and those two questions are, are driven by this emptiness, this loneliness, this need to belong. And both those questions are going to be answered in what uh, we know as Eve. So let's talk about Eve a second. We know how she came into being. We already read it. And let, um, let me ask, let me pose th three more questions. And the first would be, was, now here's Adam before God takes him into surgery. Was Eve there in the beginning before she showed up? Was she there? Yes, she was. Who was she with? Well, she was with Adam, we could say. And before she was Eve, who was she called? What was she called? Well, she was called Adam. So we could say, we could say it like this. In the beginning was Eve, Eve was with Adam, and Eve was Adam. John 1.1, 1, 1. in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, to me, this is just dynamic, because um, I phrased it like that so that we would see, I believe, that the way that Jesus came forth is he was taken out of God. I don't know if God put himself to sleep and did it at the, I don't know how that worked. That's really not, it's above our pay grade. But the, the important part was he was in God, he was God, and he was taken out of God and he was with God. In the beginning was the Word, that's the workman, and the workman was with God, and the workman was God because he's in him, he's part of him. 
It answers all the questions that theologians have tried to answer for uh, millennium of how, uh, how is Christ all God? Is God all divine? Is you know all those all those kind of things? Well, where was he before that? You know, and that, that's that's to me that just makes perfect sense. And it says that Adam was made in the image of God, and I think that might even include the way in which Adam was made, the way in which this Adam male female critter was made is going to be done in the same way that God, in God's image, in the way he did it, in the way he did it, somehow he pulled out of himself everything that is the Son, that is still God, because it came from God, it came out of God, and he's still God, even though he's now separate, he's still God. Just as Eve, when she came out, she was Adam, um, and she was with Adam, and she came out of Adam. And that's not, this is going to have a different, it's not just a, um, this is not just a head, head expanding revelation. I, there's some reason for this. And um, she, she um, you know, it's a, it says that, um, well, let me, let me put it like this. I believe Eve was kind of um, the premium package. She was a cut above the assembly line stuff. There's something different about her. She is the only earth citizen not made from dirt, directly from dirt. And that's, I think that was Adam's surprise, having all these astute observations in his degree in zoology, when he wakes up and God brings him this part of himself and he goes, oh my, this is not dust, this is not dirt, this is bone of my bone. This is flesh of my flesh. The surprise was, is I, you know, I, I wouldn't have surprised me. I mean, I, if I was Adam, I would have been leaving little piles of dirt around where God could have stumbled over them and maybe created the part that I needed. You know, a little pile of dirt on his desk, a little pile of dirt on his front porch, hoping that he would he would form and breathe into that and create that part that Adam was missing. And then when he wakes up and sees, and uh, uh, you know, we'll just have to wait and see how that surgery went and if there was any um, scar left or whatever, who knows. But uh, he suddenly realizes she's not made out of dirt. I've been wasting all that time leaving those little dirt piles around as hints. And here, God just pulls her out of me. And so for as Adam looks upon the creation, she is the only critter there that was not made directly from dust. She's kind of cut above. She's different. She has more in common, in a sense, with the master workman. Um, it says in about the word, in him was life, and that life brought light to humanity. And it says this about her. Now Adam had named his wife Eve because she was to become the mother of everyone who was living. Both the word and the woman are the life givers. Um, so this is quite a, to me this has been quite something to understand. I, under, I first got a hold of the concept um, maybe a year ago that trying to figure out where Jesus came from. And he, you know, we go through all this thing about the only begotten, and most people attribute that to being the birth, the incarnation, but he was the only begotten before the incarnation. So how was he begotten? And there's a reason it was so, and we'll get, we'll get into that as, as we go on. But there's a reason that all of this is taking place in this form. Um, so, we don't have to go too far. Well, who knows who was watching the clock. Uh, before the, the man-woman duo run into one of the commands. And they're going to have a head-on collision with one of the commands. 
Um, it was no accident, of course, that the, the talking snake came to Eve and worked it from that side. He was too smart to go to Adam. Adam would have seen through it in us. There would have been no contest. It would have been a waste of time. Um, and Adam would have picked, having a degree in zoology, he's going to pick up right away there's something strange about a talking snake. Um, <clears throat> but Eve is the more vulnerable part of Adam. She's not, um, she's, she's incredibly sensitive to the microdynamics of things, but sometimes not quite as much about the bigger picture and the atmospheric tension that can, uh, you know, Adam lived in tension. He, he, until Eve came along, he lived in tension, and tension keeps you on your feet and keeps you looking and keeps you observant, and, and um, Eve never had to do that. She is a much more um, intricate, complex, and delicate. I, I was um, ministering years ago in Peru, I think it was, and, and I met this on one of the flights between one city and another. I sat down next to, my seat was next to an American fellow, and we're sitting there talking, and it turns out he was a, um, like a JARS pilot. He was a missionary pilot, and he was down there in South America, had been there a few years, uh, flying missionaries in and out of all sorts of different places and that. So we had a great time talking. And um, so I asked him, you know, what kind of plane he flew, and I asked him, can you fly a helicopter as well? He said, yes, I can. And I said, well, talk to me about the difference. I'm curious just about the difference. And he said, oh, it's night and day. He said, um, you get a, in a small plane, you're very limited. You can, of course, go very fast and uh, get the job done in a hurry, but he said, your, your parameters of where you can go and how you, and the, where you can leave, and so he said, are much more uh, limited than that of a helicopter. Of course, the helicopter has this incredible ability to get in and out of very tricky, small, tight places. But he said, it is so hard to fly a helicopter compared to a plane. He said, you can fly a plane in your sleep. And he said, a helicopter, to fly a helicopter takes great dexterity and training. He said, it's such an intricate package. It's so, so sensitive. And I, when I was um, talking about marriage in, in one, of, one of the sessions we ran with the group, I just, that whole conversation came back to me. And I realized man is like a, the male Adam, he is like a, a plane. He, hey, watch how fast I can go. Listen to all the noise I make. I'll look what I can do. I can drop bombs. I can dust crops. I can. And the woman is like a helicopter. And it's a man. And that's why mothers hover, maybe. But there's an intricacy and a delicacy and a fine-tunedness that um, you don't find with the plane. The, the whole mechanism is so much more intricate. And uh, that's, that's, the, uh, that's, the, that's what we have in the difference between man and woman. And, and that's exactly how God wanted it to be. So um, next time we're going to dig into the fall and see what really happened there. And um, I think maybe you've already seen this, but I, I think we're in for some really interesting understandings uh, when we approach the whole uh, fall and what happened after that with the understanding of how Adam and Eve were created and how the Son of God was created, brought forth, and the sense of the two different natures of man and woman. We're going to see some interesting things. So, see you guys uh, on the next Zoom time.